Welcome everyone, I'm Dr. John White. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at WebMD, and I'm joined today by Fabrice Andre. He is the Chair of the Scientific Committee at the European Society of Medical Oncology, ESMO, where we are at today in Paris, France. Bonjour Fabrice. Hello, how are you? So remind our viewers, what is ESMO? What does it do and why is it so important? So, First, ESMO is a scientific society. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it, it, it's a member-based organization with uh, around 25,000 members. Equivalent to ASCO, correct, so, in the United ASCO. States. So uh, it has members worldwide from all over the world, and it, it aims at disseminating science, educating, uh, but I would say globally. Is really the name is European, so it has some roots in Europe, but it's really a global organization for education, uh, dissemination, and also more and more to generate framework. You know, what are the standard language? What are the, the standard of treatment, the common terminology for uh, healthcare professional to, to better care the patients? A lot of education going on, as you referenced. Uh, what are you most excited by at this conference in terms of the innovations that are being discussed? So, so then, so ESMO, the organization, indeed organized an annual conference. And today uh, we are at the ESMO 2022 in Paris with 28,000 uh, people registered and uh, vast majority on site. And what has been the editorial line, I mean the, the tagline? Tagline, for the scientific committee is understand the disease to better treat the patient. And this is extremely important, meaning all the educational program is built on this tagline, meaning that we need to understand what are the mechanism of cancer progression, what are the determinants of outcome, if we want to integrate all the wealth of innovation that is coming. So then what are the new things? In the presidential session, where it, we usually have the, the very new things, we will have very important presentation on the role of pollution on cancer and the mechan biological mechanism that induce cancer. Why is it, is it important? First, it has impact on public health, but also it's important because for us, it's really the, the signal that the oncology community must start to invest in this field of prevention. Well, I was at your booth, by the way, the ESMO booth here, and you have two bicycles, which I was impressed. Nobody was on them, I might point out, but the focus was about prevention. But let's also address historically, the academic community, the scientific community, hasn't really been focused on prevention. It's about treatment. So it's fascinating that you're talking about prevention, because usually we talk about precision medicine, right? Yes. We talk about checkpoint inhibitors, we talk about immunomodulators, and here you're saying, hey, John, we need to understand how we prevent cancer, recognizing that cancer really is, it's really a misnomer in a way because there are many different diseases. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I fully agree with you, but what is the problem we are trying to address here? The problem is that prevention has always been very low in the agenda of international conference. And we think we want to give the signal that is really the time now that clinical infrastructure, hospital, invest in this field, create teams dedicated to prevention, new structure of prevention. Why? Because we are discovering step by step that it could be that some drugs we use for patients with cancer could also be developed in the field of prevention. And for this, we need the oncologists. Mm -hmm. you know? So more and more, our conviction is that it's the oncology community that will transform the field of prevention. And we need to, to invest now. Having said that, we have two very important abstracts on this question. The other one is about early cancer detection. But of course, we have our traditionally, uh, our traditional session on immunotherapeutics, precision medicine, uh, uh, and uh, all the wealth of uh, randomized trials. So, and then in this field, 
So for patients with cancer, what are the new uh, uh, information? Well, we have this whole continuum. So you, you talk about prevention. How much cancer is preventable? 80%, 70%? What do you estimate? You know, I'm also a scientist. So as a scientist, I would say there is no limit for this question. You know, the only limit is the, is the knowledge. Well, there is some inherited mutation. So yeah, no, we do know we can that. Discuss what is, percent, 20%, 20%. Yeah, we can discuss what is the current status, what we know now, but I don't see why we would put some limit okay. about how much we can prevent uh, cancer. But indeed, so far, what are the risk factors? Genetics, hereditary cancer, or uh, habits, and we know them, it's about uh, tobacco, alcohol, sun, some sexual behavior, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, that indeed account. In France, we say that there, there is there are around 40% uh, of cancer that-, that And we're learning be, more uh, and more. We, we learn about the issues of gout, other inflammatory diseases that can have an association. But then we have early screening as well. So if we're on this continuum, how excited are you by what's happening with liquid biopsies, with other testing? Because if we can get a cancer instead of at 500,000 cells at the time of Im you know, imaging and at 10 or 50 cells, either of fragments, that's revolutionary, isn't it? I fully agree with you. So we will have one important trial presented during ESMO that is the first prospective trial testing uh, the device called uh, Gallery, okay. that is a, a tool for early cancer detection based on CTD anal analysis by a methylation uh, pattern. So, general screening of the population or a more tailored population with certain indications? Because right now, most of those have focused on a limited population or used for patients that already have a cancer and testing that way. You think it's going to be broader? So what this trial and this study is investigating is in participants who do not have cancer, 6,000 participants. How do you do? No cancer at all? No cancer. No, and no family history? Oh, they can have family history, but no detectable cancer. Can CTD analysis detect cancer? And the answer is, indeed, there is around 1% positivity and around 40% of them indeed had a cancer. So why is it important? Because it's really the landmark prospective trial that is telling us that a device based on ctDNA can detect cancer at early stage. Then, how many cancer? Which percentage? Which is type it, of cancer? It, which right? type of cancer? Is fragments? it going to have an impact yeah. on outcome? And all the question, we don't have the answer here, but the answer we have here today is that with this device done prospectively, you can detect some cancer that and were not detectable and without symptoms. It's only going to get better too. Yeah, so then the next step is improving technology, integrating this technology with other ones we already have, in order to increase the percentage of patients in which we detect cancer at earlier stage, but Especially also to decrease- for pancreatic cancer, cancers we can't cancer. detect through screening, which people forget most cancers cannot be detected yeah. through screening. So we need better tools, but then we're on, okay, everyone, we're not always gonna be able to find them on screening with current tools. We do know there's inherited mutations. So those really aren't preventable in many ways. The goal is to get them early. So then we move to treatments. And, and you talked about precision medicine. What excites you about what's going on these days at ESMO right now? So we have many uh, trials on precision medicine. We will have two randomized trials that investigate two new targets. One is gamma secretase inhibitor. So it's a first in class, first time we even hear about this, this target on clinical conference. And the second highly expected trial is a clinical trial in patients with metastatic lung cancer, Kiras mutated, testing sotoracil, that is a Kiras inhibitor, uh, and, and showing the, the magnitude of improvement associated with uh, sotoracil. The trial is positive and it improves PFS in this patient. So this is two new targets mm -hmm. that are validated at this conference. 
Then, if we go on another topic on genomics, there is a question that is extremely important is, can we define patients who present an outlier sensitivity to immunotherapeutics? And there will be one trial presented in presidential symposium, that is, few weeks of immunotherapeutics in patients with colon cancer and MSI, showing that few weeks of immunotherapeutics followed by surgery can cure patients. Why is it important? It's important because we are all facing in the world a shortage in the healthcare workforce. We have less nurses, less doctors, we all have issues on sustainability, so is we now the time to think precision medicine? How precision medicine, by identifying outlier responders, can decrease the amount of resource we need to cure a patient? And this trial on immunotherapeutics, guided by genomics, is exactly this point. Eight weeks treatment to cure patients. You think there's going to be a cure for cancer 10 years from now? What I'm convinced is that in the 10 years that are coming, we are going step by step. We are, continue, we are going to continue increasing the uh, life expectancy of patients with cancer. And quality of life too, right? Quality so of life. Of years as well as quality of years. Quality of life is a major issue. We had today a keynote on digital medicine and how EPRO can help the patient to really decrease the burden of symptom, quality of life is of course extremely important because of the very high number of patients who are cured of cancer. So we really need to decrease the burden of symptom uh, uh, in patient cured. And even though cancer rates are going down in most areas of the world, we still globally have millions of deaths of cancer every year. And, and sometimes people forget that because they hear about some of the innovations. But I want to end with, are we investing enough in, in cancer care? Because let's be honest, there are other diseases that we also need to spend time on. Cardiovascular disease is a global burden. Infectious disease is a global burden. Our governments, our industries spending enough on cancer research and development? Well, we can always claim for more, you know? This is how everyone is trying to be, I think, but the reality is that we are living in a world where we have limited resources. And the only way is, I think, what is more important for me is to be sure that any euro or dollar, or dollar invest in cancer research is well used and generates an impact for patients. Uh, that is the most important, I think. And that's why outcomes are so important yes. in this research. And I think that my conviction is that we have the tools meaning the knowledge, the biotechnology, to re really go the next step in terms of improving outcome for patients. And for this, we need now clinical trial, translational research, but the tools, meaning basic science, basic knowledge, biotechnology, the basement for progress are here. We need now to transform this into direct impact uh, for, for, for the patient. But I would not like to finish by saying uh, we need more money of the field. What we need are people who can transform one euro, one dollar into concrete and measurable uh, advances. Well, we're going to need more time at, at another uh, day because I want to ask you about diversity in clinical trials, how important that is. I want to ask you about pediatric cancers. Uh, there are a whole bunch of things that I want to talk to you about. So hopefully we'll find more time uh, when we're not at a big... Uh, international conference such as ESMO. So Dr. Fabrice Andre, I want to thank you for taking time today. Thank you and uh, have a nice day. Yes, and stay tuned for a future discussion with Dr. Andre on, on much more about where we're going in terms of cancer research and development. Thanks for watching, everyone.